Well, good morning, church. I'm Andrew, and it is uh, an honor to be the Bible teacher today, and it's especially an honor to have the opportunity to expound on this particular passage of Scripture. In the prayer meeting and on the Monday morning Zoom call Bible study that we had with the men, uh, everybody agrees that this particular passage of Scripture is especially powerful and really something special. I mean, there is some stuff in here today that not only summarizes the gospel on a bumper sticker, but also brings attention to an important element of the saving power of the gospel, and in so doing, provides insight into why many religious people are not actually saved. As most of you know, we've been in John chapter 8, and we're going to finish up that chapter today with verses 48 through 59, and I will be reading from the New King James Version today. So, thus far, Jesus has been debating with the religious leaders of his day on the issue of his authority and what is becoming a point of great contention, his very identity. Jesus just finished telling them that he has been sent from God to do the work of God, and the reason they do not accept him is because they are not actually children of God, nor are they truly children of Abraham, as they like to claim, but they are in reality children of the devil. That didn't go over so well. This was undoubtedly the most brazen thing anyone dared say to these big shots. As the uh, religious authorities, the Pharisees were the upper echelon of Jewish society. And so we pick up the dialogue today in verse 48. Then the Jews answered and said to him, Do we not rightly say that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? At this point, I think the Pharisees are probably getting a little hopeful. They've been somewhat scared of Jesus because of his large following and of undeniable miracles he has performed, the power he has displayed. But rather than inspire a healthy fear of God, their true hearts have been exposed, which are sold out to the worldly pursuits of prestige and power. The things Jesus is saying to them in this particular exchange might be giving them a spark of hope that perhaps Jesus is a madman after all, or someone empowered by demons, even though demons were not known to go around healing people. Just the opposite, in fact. Now, this reference to being a Samaritan, that was actually a racial slur at the time. It meant not being a purebred Jew, and it had to do with the people living in the area of Samaria who had been... Uh, bred into partial assimilation during the Assyrian captivity of the Northern Kingdom. So it was probably just the worst insult they could hurl at him on the fly, or perhaps was making reference to uh, them uh, calling into question the legitimacy of his birth. But Jesus ignores that insult when he replies, Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father, and you dishonor me. And I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks and judges. Most In verse 51 here, Most assuredly I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. Wow. What a radical statement. And there is a bumper sticker gospel. And there is our memory verse for the month of August on the little cards on the seats. And if ever there was a verse to keep in your heart, do you believe what Jesus just said? There is a promise of eternal life here and a condition for receiving that promise. Now, Jesus explained what the condition entails back in John chapter 6, to believe in him whom God sent. That's it. Believing in Jesus is the condition for eternal life. There is a difference, however, between believing of something and believing in something. It is possible to believe Jesus is the Son of God who died for our sins while still choosing to reject him or neglecting to personally accept the sacrifice, which is really the same thing as far as Jesus is concerned. That would be believing of him without believing in him. To believe in him means you keep his word, as our memory verse states. Uh, that is to say, his message has value. His teaching and revelations become something you treasure. And so his word becomes imprinted on your heart, so to speak. And as a result, you now have a genuine desire for uh, a right relationship with God 
uh, through his son. And uh, that begins to direct your motives. At times, our enemy will attempt to convince us that we are failing miserably in our Christian walk. But as long as we maintain a genuine desire for that right relationship with God through his son, it counts with God and we are forgiven for all the failures of our flesh. Therefore, we can never really fail as long as our heart remains right with God. God weighs the heart always and above all else, which means there's no fooling him with outward actions. Our memory verse is very similar to something Jesus will say in John 11:26. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Notice the similarities there. So what is meant by never seeing death? I mean, Christians still die, right? We've all been to their funerals. Obviously, then Jesus was not referring to physical death. All of the apostles and even Jesus himself would experience physical death. Jesus was without question then referring to a different kind of death, what we often refer to as spiritual death, although it's probably more accurate to say remain in spiritual death. Remember the meeting between Jesus and Nicodemus in John chapter 3. John said to Nicodemus, that which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit, and that only those experiencing a spiritual birth will enter the kingdom of God. And it is made clear throughout the New Testament that this is accomplished by a deliberate turning of one's heart to God and his offer of redemption in an act of inner repentance, accepting his son as Savior. That results in our spiritual birth. Then we get to live out the rest of our mortal lives in a spiritual battle. The Bible tells us the flesh wars against the spirit. And if that weren't bad enough, dark spiritual forces enjoying the battle against us. The Bible also says that the leader of those dark spiritual forces, Satan, stands before the throne of God day and night, accusing us, pointing out all of our weaknesses, failures, and sins. No wonder we just feel battered at times, don't we? The Apostle Paul wrote in Romans 7, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. Thank God this flesh dies. To Christians it is a hindrance and an anchor. 1 Corinthians 15.53 says regarding salvation, for this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. That's what happens to those of us who believe in Jesus, who keep his word, when this corruptible body of sin and death mercifully shuts down, we are rescued. We do not see death. We leave the corruptible behind and put on immortality. Praise God. The Pharisees respond to Jesus in a predictable manner in verses 52 and 53. Then the Jews said to him, Now we know that you have a demon. Abraham is dead and the prophets, and you say, If anyone keeps my word, he shall never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham? who is dead, and the prophets are dead. Who do you make yourself out to be? Dangerous question there. Then and now. These guys didn't realize that, of course. Their hope is increasing. They might well be breathing a sigh of relief at this point. Aha, he is a madman, all those miracles and followers notwithstanding. After all, the people all regarded John the Baptist as a prophet, and he was put in prison. These religious leaders were continually attempting to trap Jesus in his words by baiting him with deceptive questions, which Jesus, of course, always saw right through, and he fielded the dishonest questions in a manner which usually boomeranged on them. But this question remains hanging in Scripture for all of us. Who does Jesus make himself out to be? This topic is the kind of thing that makes some people get up and walk out of church in the middle of a sermon. That's why I had Marge lock the sanctuary doors today. Just kidding, uh, fire codes and all. But we need to get this straight. Why? Here are a couple other passages why. John 8, 24, Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins, for if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. We had this verse in our study just a couple weeks ago. It's Jesus speaking. We need to take it seriously. If we do not believe that Jesus is he, we will die in our sins. That Jesus is who? That Jesus is who, who he says he is, which we'll get to in a moment. 
But let us also be mindful of this statement of Jesus. Many, this is from Matthew 7, 22 and 23. Many will say to me on that day, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy on your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Here is a group of people, and a large group of people, apparently, at the final judgment trying to argue their way into heaven, pointing out the fact that they proclaimed Jesus with their mouths and preached his name. Yet they are not saved because Jesus does not know them. This would perhaps indicate that they were hypocrites or maybe were preaching a fictional character using the name of Jesus as opposed to the real Jesus revealed in Scripture. I'm not entirely certain there's a difference between being a hypocrite and preaching a phony Jesus. This is critical, friends. We need to know the real Jesus. Remember, God knows our hearts. And I do believe that an honest heart one which holds a healthy fear of God and seeks him in proper humility, will find him and consequently will find the real Jesus. Because the Bible tells us in Jeremiah 29, 13, and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. That's a promise from God. When we genuinely seek him, we will find him. These religious leaders of Jesus' day, for the most part, had ulterior motives. The only Messiah they really wanted showing up was one who would glorify them, not the true Messiah prophesied in the scriptures which they had memorized. They might have had scripture memorized, but their hearts were far from God. They remind me of people so stubborn in their doctrinal viewpoints, they won't even let God correct them. Jesus responds to them in verses 54 through 56. Jesus answered, if I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father who honors me, of whom you say that he is your God. Yet you have not known him, but I know him. And if I say I do not know him, I shall be a liar like you. But I do know him and keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Another radical statement of Jesus. Jesus tells him that Abraham was glad to have seen Jesus' day. What was Jesus referring to here? If you recall the encounter between God and Abraham in Genesis chapter 18, God appeared to Abraham in the form of a man accompanied by two angels also appearing in human form. It was during this encounter when God informed Abraham and Sarah that 90-something-year-old Sarah would soon be bearing Abraham a son. And also when God chose to reveal to Abraham his immediate plans for destroying the wicked cities of the plain, which included Sodom and Gomorrah. Most Bible scholars feel that this is what is known as a theophany, or sometimes referred to as a Christophany, that is, an appearance of Jesus in human form in the Old Testament, and that this is what Jesus is referring to in our present passage when he says that Abraham was glad to see his day. But there is also the very interesting character of Melchizedek mentioned in the story of Abraham. Melchizedek is identified as the king of Salem and the priest of the Most High God, Abraham paid him tithes, and Melchizedek blessed Abraham. In various other scriptures, including the New Testament book of Hebrews, we are told that Jesus is our high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, which is a superior order of priesthood to the Jewish Levitical priesthood. We are also told that Melchizedek has no genealogy, which is quite a statement. Therefore, many people do believe Melchizedek was none other than Jesus himself. Are they right? I don't know. I personally have no problem with both viewpoints being right. According to Jesus, Abraham did meet him. The religious leaders reply again in verse 57. Then the Jews said to him, You are not yet 50 years old, and you have seen Abraham? And Jesus responds, Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, Before Abraham was, I am. Then they took up stones to throw at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. Jesus says to them that before Abraham was, I am. This might be one of the most significant statements in the entire Bible. If you remember when God commissioned Moses from the burning bush to send him to rescue the children of Israel from Egypt, one of Moses' objections was, if I tell them you sent me, they're going to ask me your name. What should I tell them your name is? And God answered him in Exodus 3.14. 
And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, this you shall take, say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Jesus knew exactly what he was doing here when he answered the Pharisees, referring to himself using the same name God identified himself to Moses as. It brings to mind the popular Christmas song, Mary, Did You Know? It's a climactic lyric, Mary, did you know your baby boy is the great I am? I just love that. And these guys knew exactly what Jesus was saying, which is why they reacted by picking up stones in an attempt to kill him on the spot. To them, it was a shocking perpetration of utter blasphemy. And Jesus simply slipped right by them, as he did on several other similar occasions, because his appointed time to die for us was not yet. So, was Jesus just messing with these guys to irk them? Was this an isolated kind of an incident? Or are there enough additional supporting scriptures to create expositional constancy for Jesus identifying himself as God? Let's wrap this up by rapid-firing through a few additional relevant verses, shall we? Here we go. John 10.30, Jesus says, I and the Father are one. John 14, 8 through 9, Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long, and you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. Acts 20, 28, be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. Titus 2, 13, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Hebrews 1, 8, but to the Son, God says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. John chapter 1, and the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Colossians 1, 15 through 16, He, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of our all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth. Isaiah 44, 6, thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. Now watch this. Revelation 1, 8, God speaking says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Revelation 22, 13, Jesus speaking says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Are you starting to get the idea here of who Scripture actually reveals Jesus to be? In one of the most quoted sections from his book, Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis said that the most illogical viewpoint of all is that Jesus was a good guy and a good moral teacher, but ultimately was just a man because Jesus claimed to be God. Therefore, he must be either a lunatic on the same level as someone claiming to be a poached egg. I'm still quoting C.S. Lewis here. Uh, a liar of the worst type from the pit of hell or what he claimed to be. There's no other alternative. Jesus must be a lunatic, a liar, or what he claimed to be. Liars are not good people and lunatics are not good teachers. Okay, so the Bible teaches in certain places that Jesus is God, but is the Bible really all true? That is a topic for another day, but I think most of you know Pastor Householder regards the Bible to be the inerrant, infallible Word of God, as do I, because frankly, if it isn't, our Christian faith has no solid foundation. I mean, if the Bible isn't all true, since no one has authority to discern which parts are true, in that case, all we really have are the ideas and claims of sinners to argue with each other over. I look at it like this. If God is powerful enough to create the universe and all life, he's powerful enough to write a book. That much is obvious. So the only question then is whether he chose to. And I think I see the answer to that whenever I see a cross. If God loves me enough to send his only begotten son to die in my place, that is a God who loves me enough to put an inerrant Bible in my hands when I humbly open it, seeking him with my whole heart. God promises we will find him when we sincerely search for him. 
But what about the different translations and the fact that some versions have unfortunate translations of certain passages? That may be true, but when I humbly open my Bible, sincerely seeking God, I find him. But what about several sentences added to 1 John chapter 5 under year 1000, which weren't in the original manuscripts? This is the Bible God put in my hands. When I humbly open it, seeking God with my whole heart, I find him, and I find my Savior, who loves me and gave himself for me, that I might not see death by keeping his word, believing in him whom God sent. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for this beautiful day and this chance to gather here as a spiritual family. Thank you for this particularly powerful passage of scripture this morning. May it Speak to us on some deep level, Lord, which draws us closer to you. We want to be close to you. Help us to have honest hearts which humbly seek you, which hold a healthy fear of you, which seek you, Lord. We want to be close to you. Be close to us this week. Help us. Give to each of us, I pray, Lord, the healing, the strength, and the wisdom as is needful for this week. Guide us in all the small things and big things, everything we'll be facing. And keep us close to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you.